Section 7 of The Day Boy and the Night Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Day Boy and the Night Girl. The Romance of Photogen and Nycteris. By George MacDonald. Chapters 18 through 20. Chapter 18. Refuge. Fixing her telescope on the motionless form, that she might see it at once when the morning came, Watho went down from the tower to Photogen's room. He was much better by this time, and before she left him, he had resolved to leave the castle that very night. The darkness was terrible indeed, but Watho was worse than even the darkness, and he could not escape in the day. As soon, therefore, as the house seemed still, he tightened his belt hung to it his hunting-knife, put a flask of wine and some bread in his pocket, and took his bow and arrows. He got from the house and made his way at once up to the plain. But what with his illness, the terrors of the night, and his dread of the wild beasts, when he got to the level he could not walk a step further, and sat down, thinking it better to die than to live. In spite of his fears, however, sleep contrived to overcome him, and he fell at full length on the soft grass. He had not slept long when he woke with such a strange sense of comfort and security that he thought the dawn at last must have arrived. But it was dark night about him. And the sky, no, it was not the sky, but the blue eyes of his naiad looking down upon him. Once more he lay with his head in her lap, and all was well, for plainly the girl feared the darkness as little as he the day. "'Thank you,' he said. "'You are like live armor to my heart. You keep the fear off me. I have been very ill since then. Did you come up out of the river when you saw me cross?' "'I don't live in the water,' she answered. "'I live under the pale lamp, and I die under the bright one.' "'Ah, yes, I understand now,' he returned." I would not have behaved as I did last time if I had understood, but I thought you were mocking me, and I am so made that I cannot help being frightened at the darkness. I beg your pardon for leaving you as I did, for, as I say, I did not understand. Now I believe you were really frightened, were you not? I was, indeed, answered Nycteris, and shall be again. But why you should be I cannot in the least understand." You must know how gentle and sweet the darkness is, how kind and friendly, how soft and velvety. It holds you to its bosom and loves you. A little while ago I lay faint and dying under your hot lamp. What is it you call it? The sun, murmured Photogen. How I wish he would make haste. Ah, do not wish that. Do not, for my sake, hurry him. I can take care of you from the darkness, but I have no one to take care of me from the light. As I was telling you, I lay dying in the sun. All at once I drew a deep breath. A cool wind came and ran over my face. I looked up. The torture was gone, for the death lamp itself was gone. I hope he does not die and grow brighter yet. My terrible headache was all gone, and my sight was come back. I felt as if I were new made, but I did not get up at once, for I was tired still. The grass grew cool about me and turned soft in color. Something wet came upon it, and it was now so pleasant to my feet that I rose and ran about. And when I had been running about a long time, all at once I found you lying, just as I had been lying a little while before. So I sat down beside you to take care of you, till your life, and my death, should come again. How good you are, you beautiful creature! "'Why, you forgave me before ever I asked you,' cried Photogen. "'Thus they fell a-talking, and he told her what he knew of his history, "'and she told him what she knew of hers, "'and they agreed they must get away from Watho as far as ever they could. "'And we must set out at once,' said Nycteris. "'The moment the morning comes,' returned Photogen. "'We must not wait for the morning,' said Nycteris, for then I shall not be able to move, and what would you do the next night? Besides, Watho sees best in the daytime. Indeed, you must come now, Photogen, you must. I cannot, I dare not, said Photogen. 
I cannot move. If I but lift my head from your lap, the very sickness of terror seizes me. I shall be with you, said Nycteris, soothingly. I will take care of you till your dreadful sun comes, and then you may leave me and go away as fast as you can. Only please put me in a dark place first, if there is one to be found. I will never leave you again, Nycteris, cried Photogen. Only wait till the sun comes and brings me back my strength, and we will go together and never, never part any more. No, no, persisted Nycteris. We must go now and you must learn to be strong in the dark as well as in the day, else you will always be only half brave. I have begun already, not to fight your son, but to try to get at peace with him and understand what he really is, and what he means with me, whether to hurt me or to make the best of me. You must do the same with my darkness. But you don't know what mad animals there are away there towards the south, said Photogen. They have huge green eyes, and they would eat you up like a bit of celery, you beautiful creature. Come, come, you must, said Nycteris, or I shall have to pretend to leave you to make you come. I have seen the green eyes you speak of, and I will take care of you from them. You? How can you do that? If it were day now, I could take care of you from the worst of them. But as it is, I can't even see them for this abominable darkness. I could not see your lovely eyes but for the light that is in them that lets me see straight into heaven through them. They are windows into the very heaven beyond the sky. I believe they are the very place where the stars are made. You come, then, or I shall shut them, said Nycteris, and you shan't see them any more till you are good. Come, if you can't see the wild beasts, I can. You can? And you ask me to come? cried Photogen. Yes, answered Nycteris, and more than that, I see them long before they can see me, so that I am able to take care of you. But how? persisted Photogen. You can't shoot with bow and arrow, or stab with a hunting knife. No, but I can keep out of the way of them all. Why, just when I found you, I was having a game with two or three of them at once. I see and sent them too, long before they are near me long before they can see or scent me. "'You don't see or scent any now, do you?' said Photogen uneasily, rising on his elbow. "'No, none at present. I will look,' replied Nycteris, and sprang to her feet. "'Oh, oh, do not leave me, not for a moment,' cried Photogen, straining his eyes to keep her face in sight through the darkness. "'Be quiet, or they will hear you,' she returned." The wind is from the south, and they cannot scent us. I have found out all about that. Ever since the dear dark came, I have been amusing myself with them, getting every now and then just into the edge of the wind, and letting one have a sniff of me. Oh, horrible, cried Photogen. I hope you will not insist on doing so any more. What was the consequence? Always, the very instant, he turned with dashing eyes and bounded towards me, only he could not see me, you must remember. But my eyes being so much better than his, I could see him perfectly well, and would run away around him until I scented him, and then I knew he could not find me anyhow. If the wind were to turn and run the other way now, there might be a whole army of them down upon us, leaving no room to keep out of their way. You had better come. She took him by the hand. He yielded and rose, and she led him away. But his steps were feeble, and as the night went on, he seemed more and more ready to sink. "'Oh, dear, I am so tired, and so frightened,' he would say. "'Lean on me,' Nycteris would return, putting her arm around him, or patting his cheek. "'Take a few steps more. Every step away from the castle is clear gain. Lean harder on me. I am quite strong and well now.' So they went on. The piercing night eyes of Nycteris descried not a few pairs of green ones gleaming like holes in the darkness, and many a round she made to keep far out of their way, but she never said to Photogen she saw them. Carefully she kept him off the uneven places, and on the softest and smoothest of the grass, talking to him gently all the way as they went, of the lovely flowers and the stars, 
How comfortable the flowers looked, down in their green beds, and how happy the stars up in their blue beds. When the morning began to come, he began to grow better, but was dreadfully tired with walking instead of sleeping, especially after being so long ill. Nycteris, too, what with supporting him, what with growing fear of the light, which was beginning to ooze out of the east, was very tired. At length, both equally exhausted, neither was able to help the other. As if by consent they stopped. Embracing each the other, they stood in the midst of the wide grassy land, neither of them able to move a step, each supported only by the leaning weakness of the other, each ready to fall if the other should move. But while the one grew weaker still, the other had begun to grow stronger. When the tide of the night began to ebb, the tide of the day began to flow, and now the sun was rushing to the horizon, borne upon its foaming billows. And ever as he came, Photogen revived. At last the sun shot up into the air like a bird from the hand of the Father of Lights. Nycteris gave a cry of pain and hid her face in her hands. "'Oh, me!' she sighed. "'I am so frightened. The terrible light stings so.' But the same instant, through her blindness, she heard Photogen give a low, exultant laugh, and the next felt herself caught up. She who all night long had tended and protected him like a child— was now in his arms, borne along like a baby, with her head lying on his shoulder. But she was the greater, for suffering more, she feared nothing. CHAPTER Nineteen: THE WEREWOLF At the very moment when Photogen caught up Nycteris, the telescope of Watho was angrily sweeping the tableland. She swung it from her in rage, and running to her room, shut herself up. There she anointed herself from top to toe with a certain ointment, shook down her long red hair and tied it around her waist, then began to dance, whirling around and around, faster and faster, growing angrier and angrier, until she was foaming at the mouth with fury. When Falca went looking for her, she could not find her anywhere. As the sun rose, the wind slowly changed and went around, until it blew straight from the north. Photogen and Nycteris were drawing near the edge of the forest, Photogen still carrying Nycteris, when she moved a little on his shoulder uneasily, and murmured in his ear, "'I smell a wild beast. That way, the way the wind is coming.' Photogen turned back towards the castle, and saw a dark speck on the plain. As he looked, it grew larger. It was coming across the grass with the speed of the wind. It came nearer and nearer, it looked long and low, but that might be because it was running at a great stretch. He set Nycteris down under a tree, in the black shadow of its bowl, strung his bow, and picked out his heaviest, longest, sharpest arrow. Just as he set the notch on the string, he saw that the creature was a tremendous wolf, rushing straight at him. He loosened his knife in its sheath, drew another arrow halfway from the quiver, lest the first should fail, and took his aim at a good distance to leave time for a second chance. He shot. The arrow rose, flew straight, descended, struck the beast, and started again into the air, doubled like a letter V. Quickly Photogen snatched the other, shot, cast his bow from him, and drew his knife. But the arrow was in the brute's chest, up to the feather. It tumbled heels over head with a great thud of its back on the earth, gave a groan, made a struggle or two, and lay stretched out motionless. "'I've killed it, Nycteris,' cried Photogen. "'It is a great red wolf.' "'Oh, thank you,' answered Nycteris, feebly from behind the tree. "'I was sure you would. I was not a bit afraid.' Photogen went up to the wolf. It was a monster. But he was vexed that his first arrow had behaved so badly, and was the less willing to lose the one that had done him such good service. With a long and a strong pull, he drew it from the brute's chest. Could he believe his eyes? There lay, no wolf, but Watho, with her hair tied around her waist. The foolish witch had made herself invulnerable, as she supposed, but had forgotten that, to torment Photogen therewith, she had handled one of his arrows. He ran back to Nycteris and told her. She shuddered and wept and would not look. Chapter 20 all is well. 
There was now no occasion to fly a step farther. Neither of them feared any one but Watho. They left her there and went back. A great cloud came over the sun, and rain began to fall heavily, and Nycteris was much refreshed, grew able to see a little, and with Photogen's help walked gently over the cool, wet grass. They had not gone far before they met Fargu and the other huntsmen. Photogen told them he had killed a great red wolf, and it was Madame Watho. The huntsmen looked grave, but gladness shone through. Then, said Fargu, I will go and bury my mistress. But when they reached the place, they found she was already buried, in the maws of sundry birds and beasts which had made their breakfast of her. Then Fargu, overtaking them, would, very wisely, have Photogen go to the king and tell him the whole story. But Photogen, yet wiser than Fargu, would not set out until he had married Nycteris. For then, he said, the king himself can't part us, and if ever two people couldn't do the one without the other, those two are Nycteris and I. She has got to teach me to be a brave man in the dark, and I have got to look after her until she can bear the heat of the sun, and he helps her to see instead of blinding her. They were married that very day, and the next day they went together to the king and told him the whole story. But whom should they find at the court but the father and mother of Photogen, both in high favor with the king and queen? Aurora nearly died with joy, and told them all how Watho had lied and made her believe her child was dead. No one knew anything of the father or mother of Nycteris, but when Aurora saw in the lovely girl her own azure eyes shining through night and its clouds, it made her think strange things, and wonder how even the wicked themselves may be a link to join together the good. Through Watho, the mothers, who had never seen each other, had changed eyes in their children. The king gave them the castle and lands of Watho, and there they lived and taught each other for many years that were not long. But hardly had one of them passed before Nycteris had come to love the day best, because it was the clothing and crown of Photogen, and she saw that the day was greater than the night, and the sun more lordly than the moon. And Photogen had come to love the night best, because it was the mother and home of Nycteris. But who knows, Nycteris would say to Photogen, that when we go out, we shall not go into a day as much greater than your day as your day is greater than my night. End of section 7. End of The Day Boy and the Night Girl by George MacDonald.